Okay, welcome to Wednesday's edition of Come On 25. And I hope you had a good week. It's been Twitter, Twitter all the way. And what's interesting is that, um, well, you guys have been mostly using it during Comp 300. <laughs> <laughs> the interesting thing is that um, I had you guys write about it, and I also did my part to write about it as well. And uh, lots of interesting comments. I actually had one whole comment sheet in there, but let me see if we can just pull it up here. Uh, WordPress.com. Let's look at some of your blog posts. So you had very interesting comments, um, things to say about it. And oh yeah, we haven't decided the blog of the week. So I actually want you guys to go visit some of these um, award winners, so-called, and then figure out for me which should deserve the blog of the week. So I don't know. I don't care if you have to saka somebody. Just um, drop a comment on your blog and let me, and I'll see if um, who could get the, the award. Okay. Um, Wow, really good. Some of you <laughs> mentioned, a lot of you spotted this thing about microblogging. Any of you know what that is about? Where the idea of microblogging come about? Obviously, you've, you've read it somewhere, right? You've seen it in the media and all that. Some of you did Google searches, and Google might not pull out everything because it's such a new thing. So, actually, if you're doing research on things that are very recent, especially like disasters that just happened, let's say in Singapore somewhere, the best search engine to use would be a blog search engine because that would track the most recent things. Google takes a few days to track things, so you want something more recent. So there are things that um, uh, blog search engines like Blogger's blog search engine and Technorati's blog search engine would, would help you out. So some of you spotted that microblogging is sort of like a way of blogging, but it's very quick, it's very short. It's just like how Twitter works, very quick and short. Uh, it's a reflection less of things like opinions and all that, but more of a stream of what we call stream of consciousness. Okay, that is what's going on right now and so on and so forth. So, lots of interesting comments. Some people didn't feel that it was like an online community, which is absolutely fair. Twitter, for some, if you think about it, Twitter seems more like a very passive online community. It it doesn't mean it doesn't keep a connection going. It creates connection on the fly. That is, you can have a bunch of friends. And only when you ask a particular thing that involves certain people or when people respond, then an ad hoc community forms. Okay, that means it comes on the spot. So it isn't what we call really persistent, right? And so, so some of the things that, um, I also blogged about it, and actually my intention was when you guys blog about something this new, that you guys would actually get some traffic to your blog, which I understand is a main problem because, you know, some of you are getting tired, like, I'm doing all this writing and how come I'm not getting any um, what you call uh, comments or anything like that? There's actually a song for this. Um, yeah, there's actually a song for this. I just want you to take a listen. Really evil song. Sprites and the songs called I Start a Blog which nobody reads. <laughs> nobody read, yeah. Okay, anyway, that's that. And so it's a fun, it's it's a real life thing as in people don't always read all everyone else's blogs. So there are actually tips out there on um, wait a sec. There are tips out there on how to sort of boost your blog ratings or, or readership and so on and so forth like my this is one of my friends uh, in the states he uh, writes all about technology and all that um, you know and he talks about things like usability content but the main but big thing that a lot of you could do to help to boost it straight away is to use Technorati 
and uh, I would I recommend that you guys claim your blog on Technorati. If you go to Technorati, go figure out how to sign up, throw your blog in there so that it can be searched. So when people search for anything, let's say Twitter, which, you know, people tend to search about things on a very uh, periodic basis. That is, when something happens, they search for something like, if it's about Tammy, everybody will search about Tammy and then you get hits. So there are people who, what they call link whore, who basically plug in words Tammy in a blog just to get traffic because they know people are searching for it. So right now people are searching for Twitter. Okay, that's, that's, that's the way it is right now. Everybody's talking about Twitter, everybody's searching for Twitter. And I've gotten my yeah. fair share of traffic it's because of Technorati and people who've read my blog. And uh, if you do add your thing to Technorati, you might start to get some traffic as well. But the best thing to do really is when you talk about a particular topic, okay, these, these are tips to get your blog like really out there. Um, when you blog about a particular topic and you know it's hot, and you know everyone else is talking about it, you can't just sit there and wait for people to come to you. What you want to do is to go out to their blogs to, who, who happen, that happen to talk about the same kind of things, like Twitter or whatever, and then leave a comment there. And if it's an insightful comment, people will come to your blog as well. And then once that happens and it's really good stuff, word of mouth spreads. And that's what happened to mine as well. One of the pretty big PR bloggers, Steve Rubo, actually mentioned my post and now like my friends have like, sh well, shot up to like 100 over or something. But it's not like my, my real friends, it's just that it makes me feel good, that's all. <laughs> so, but anyway, so that's kind of like how you work it. You gotta, I've told some of you before, you gotta plant the seeds and then let it grow. So you, you go to people's blogs and plant your seeds there and then it sort of like creates that relationship after that. So it's a reciprocal kind of thing. Some people do it more of a strategic way, but um, it's legitimate if you leave something um, insightful on your blogs. Okay. So over the course of uh, the next few blog assignments, I'm going to make you very conscious of that. That is, um, a lot of your work, I'm going to try and have it, uh, have you guys push it out there and really get in touch with people out on the blogosphere so that they can come back and find you or they would know about you. Uh, right now, you you are like there, but nobody knows you're there. So we need to connect you up with the rest of the blogosphere. Um, but anyway, let me just talk a little bit about Twitter, just to set the record straight. Um, where, where did I write about it? Let's see. Oh yeah, okay. So there are tons of hacks for Twitter. And when you guys were actually writing your blog post about it, uh, interesting, the first major newspaper to pick it up was Wall Street Journal. So that happened over the weekend. Wall Street Journal uh, covered Twitter, but covered Twitter in a very interesting way. They didn't really say that it was necessarily good. They talked about how people establish um, sort of like microblog in there, and, but were very much frustrated because of service downtime. So, um, uh, some people complain about invasion of privacy. So you can read the article there, I've got it all there. Uh, but it's interesting how you know we're, we're sort of like riding the wave. People are talking about it and we are on it right now. So every time we see something new, it'd be interesting to actually talk about it. So that that's in a way that, you know, I, I do that a lot on my blog. I talk about things that people are talking about so that they would find it interesting and they would come to me. But everybody has a different way of doing things. So I'm just trying to tell you that uh, even in the blogosphere or in the media world or whatever, you can spot trends, what we call trend spotting, and sort of ride the wave. And then, um, you find that there will be a whole bunch of people interested in what you talk about too. So, um, tons of other posts here, but uh, oh, Google News also added Twitter to their news source, meaning that Google News, okay, which tracks International Herald Tribune, New York Times, and also tracks Twitter. And at first we were wondering why? Why would you want to track private conversations and so on? Well, what happens is that if you notice on Twitter, uh, I, know I wrote about how um, there are interesting uses, okay, so I categorize each part, interesting uses of Twitter and basically there are news, com news companies that have gone in there, okay, there are BBC News, New York Times and all that and you can add them as your friend and get news updates. Then Renhau, for example, pointed out to me uh, the weather system that you can add as a friend, so I added WX Singapore and gives you weather reports. So it's kind of like a mini RSS reader of sorts, it gives you updates but it's very short and concise. So if you think about it, first we have blogs, which are heavy and rich. Then we have RSS feeds, which are also pretty complex, but more um, streamlined or more slimmed down. And then finally we have Twitter, which is the most lightweight. 
media, okay? It can go right to your mobile phone straight away through SMS. So that's like, if we were to paint a picture of how the media, using the media richness theory, it's kind of heavy to medium and then light. So it's, it's really the repurposing of content. It's the same content, it's just repurposed for different con uh, media. So I guess that's the nice thing about Twitter, why it's so popular. It's really lightweight, it, it gets around really fast. People have used it for different kinds of things. Um, people come out with hacks for it. Because it's so simple, a lot, some of you complained that it was too simple, which, which you know, is agreeable. But the simplicity is something that, you know, for example, Apple does very well. It takes something simple, a simple concept, and really like stretch it to its fullest. So that's what Twitter kind of does. And because Twitter um, released their APIs, which is kind of like for programmers or coders to sort of like use Twitter for other things, people come up with interesting hacks. For example, on Twitter Vision, if you take a look at it, Twitter Vision basically lets you see who's Twittering right now in the world. And the map sort of like flies around showing you who's Twittering at which country and so on and so forth. So kind of neat. And now there's also a Twitter search. So let's say I want to search about any, search for any conversation in Twitter that mentions my name, for example. Someone could be saying bad things about me. I want to check, right? So I could do that um, just by going to the search. And Twitter search basically, well, if, it, if the network connection isn't crazy, Twitter search basically um, lets me put, up, put in my name or whatever, and then I can see, like, for example, yeah, so I got brain opera there, so I can see all, all conversations. But basically, uh, let's say I, I go for, written how yours is far, I, I, F A R I, R I, no, 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 F A R I, N E W L I. Hey, that's all. That's strange. Now, it could be that the system's kind of funky, but the Lego heads that you see here, Lego heads represent how much activity you had. So, very minimal. God, there are some people with a lot of posts, so the Lego heads like stretch all over the place. So if they use different metrics, okay, which is pretty interesting. So that's uh, Twitter search. So I don't know, you, if you're doing research and all that, I know it's, you know, if they put it on a public, which uh, some of us do, then, um, you know, it's, it's fair, fair use, okay, fair game that you can uh, track what people are talking about. Um, so remember Ben, he's right now in Cambodia. He's uh, texting in his, uh, to SMS Cambodia about what he's doing right now. So he's in second day in Siam. He's on a tuk-tuk right now. You guys know what tuk-tuk is, right? Yeah. And so on and so forth. Um, okay, Maria. Okay, so uh, one new thing that... Okay, so there's a lot of things going on. And as you can see, the service is overburdened because there's so many people using it. And there are tons of flaws, but... Um, you know, it's a first generation service, so it's brand new, that's why. But what's interesting is, here's, here's a little tip. If um, you have a ton of friends and people who add you, but you know, you know, you realize it's hard to add people if you've got like, let's say 10 people who add you as a friend and you want to add them back. Uh, Twitter now has the ability to add all friends on one, one fell swoop. Okay, if you go to the, oops, if you go to the followers page actually, it's a followers page, you can sort of like, see that. So anyway, that's just something new. They are always rolling things out. This is all brand new stuff. You see this link here, it says add them all as friends. So basically, if uh, you want to, the only problem is that some people complain that then you get too many updates. Okay. So anyway, so this is work in progress and it's fun that you guys tried it. Um, you know, if you guys don't want to use it anymore, that's fine. Uh, it'd be interesting to see what direction Twitter takes because there are lots of comments about it. Some people have already started commenting that uh, it's more like a fad, that people will eventually drop the service because people are just using it because it's popular and so on and so forth. So it's interesting. Some, some, you know, different people have different opinions. What I personally love about it though, what I personally love about it, is the idea that it can be used as an as, uh, emergency alert system. So you know nowadays how volatile our our world is, okay, in terms of disasters, weather and all that. And if you think about it, even though we're so connected with all our technology out there, there's still no one proper way to alert people to situations, okay? So, for example, what's neat is um, this university, which I can't make up the, an acronym here, uh, USGS Earthquake Center, 
they, you can subscribe to them as a friend and if you're living in say San Francisco you can get alerted to earthquakes before they happen okay so that's kind of neat so there are lots of interesting uses out there and uh, it'll be interesting to see where people take it so anyway that's that's Twitter and that is an example of an online um, community so I'll dive right into here and then after that talk a little bit of the theory about what we've covered so far, not too much, and after that go back into more interesting communities that you guys might not have uh, seen yet. Okay. Alright, so online communities, intro to the internet, blah blah blah. What is a community first of all? Um, so by definition, we know that it's a social institution comprised of people who identify themselves as a group. It can be based on location or identity. Okay, so okay, you guys get the gist of it. It's not too difficult there. Um, however, the idea of a community has always been changing. Okay, you guys know this that community is 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 has a definition that's not set in stone. Okay, because last time sociologists, for example, sociologists have argued that community has sort of, the understanding of community has sort of changed with the rise of industrialism in cities. Okay, so yes, so uh, some of your presentations have alluded to that. Okay, um, and a very strong um, concept that reflects this is the, this German thinkers uh, uh, term here. There's Gemeinschaft and Gemein, Gemein, Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft. Okay, so try to say that ten times repeatedly. But anyway, any of you know what's the difference between? Main shaft and Giselle shaft, <laughs> but you guys, have you have you seen it in the readings at all? It was mentioned, right? So these are things that are quite important. And as you, let's say, if you're interested in studying communities in future, let's say you're you you want to be a marketing person or whatsoever, these ideas are very important. Your main shaft. Okay, I, I don't have the definitions in my slides because I want you to look it up. But Jermaine Shaft is the idea that last time, um, before the age of industrialization and cities and so on, so you guys might want to take notes, the idea is that our community was very close-knit. Okay? Our community was as close as our relatives, as our family, and that's it. Okay? That, that was the extent of our community before the age of industrialization. We we're talking about a cottage you know, when you live in cottages and villages and so on. So that's the extent of it. So family is a very strong example of Jermaine Shaft. What about Giselle Shaft? Okay. Just as a hint of what Giselle Shaft is about, um, it is part of the word that describes companies in Germany. Okay. Germany, there's this in Germany, there's this word for, uh, you know, in Singapore, we're private limited, right? That's to indicate that it's a private company and so on. So in Germany, there's this, um, there's this abbreviation, and it, it has this word Giselleshaft in there. The idea of Giselleshaft is uh, a community that is that is much larger, okay, and you might not have strong connections with others within this community, okay. So a good example of Giselleshaft is a company or even society itself because what happens in Giselle Sharp now this guy he wrote seven volumes to explain this so I'm really like putting it down in 10 minutes which is ridiculous but Giselle Sharp basically is the idea that it gets that uh, a community gets so large that we start to see stratification that is racial divide economic divide and so on which you might not see in a Jermaine Sharp uh, uh, um, community, okay. Uh, so uh, further ideas of Giselle Shaft could be things like school. Okay, you might know people but not know everybody. Uh, likewise, in terms of motivations, commitment to a group, you might be you definitely be more committed to a Jermaine Shaft environment rather than Giselle Shaft. That means you wouldn't be able to want to sacrifice yourself as much to a Giselle Shaft uh, community or environment. So, on. so all these notions fit into. Each category here, Jermaine Sharp and Giselle Sharp. They, you know, we are transitioning, that is what to say. Notice that so in the past we might be living in villages and so on, and then we have age of industrialization, we have work in companies, and our, our links get weaker, but we have more people. So it's kind of like we increase the quantity of nodes or connections that we have. But these 
but what we make up in uh, quantity, we lose in quality. Okay, that is, these links start to get weak. And now, at this present age, because of virtual communities, some are arguing that it is extended even further, where we know a lot of people, but do we actually know them at all? Okay, so this is this is transition or this movement, okay, <coughs> of the way communities are so understood now. So, the indi what this whole the gist of all this is really to talk about the decline of community. That is the idea of community becoming very weak already. Okay, weak in terms of wellness, but like I said, could be an issue of quality versus quantity. Okay, make up a lot of people, but it's just that we don't know them as well. Okay. So, other interesting thinkers or academics or writers who also noticed this uh, was Robert Putnam. Okay, any of you know what Robert Putnam wrote about? What was his main thesis about? Okay, he talked about social capital. Okay, social capital is also very part and parcel of uh, what we call like the health of a community. Okay, and there are different ways. He, 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 this idea of social capital is very convoluted, okay, but it's <coughs> important to sort of understand where, where it's heading. So in his book called Bowling Alone, he argues that uh, community and public participation is declining. So basically, he talks about this bowling um, league, okay, and how people in the past used to take it up very, quite seriously, and it's a good form of community or participation with people in the neighborhood and so on. But now we don't see as many people bowling anymore, okay? Or, or people don't take it as seriously as a sort of like a traditional religion anymore. They don't do it as much. Uh, there are other examples about communities that sort of died out, okay? So he talks about that. He talks about, basically one of the big key things that he talks about is how people are less civically engaged. That is, maybe in the past people might have been very involved in politics, but now people, because there's so many things going on, people are distracted or whatsoever, and they don't feel so much part of a country anymore, or a nation, and they're they they not so interested in nation building anymore, okay? Which is something that Singapore is, uh, Singapore government is trying to work very hard to, to foster citizenry, okay? Better citizenry, uh, more involved citizen, uh, civic engagement and so on with uh, citizens. So there are, there are things that are going on and we're trying to figure out ways to build that up or, or sort of revive that, that, um, that decline, right? So here's sort of like a takeaway definition. And mind you, social capital, like I mentioned, is so convoluted. For example, if you just look up Wikipedia on social capital, you get tons of definitions. And Wikipedia doesn't cover all of it. There are tons. So here's one from Putnam. Okay? Here's Putnam's version. Social capital refers to the collective value of all social networks and the inclination that arises from these networks to do things for each other. So what does that mean? What's that all about? Basically, it means this. That is, how well is your community? Are people willing to uh, do things for each other? Okay, is it strong enough that people are willing to do things for each other? And what can we do to foster that? What are, the, what are the things that are causing a decline in social capital? So you know about economic capital, you know about uh, what's the uh, gift, gift economy and all that? There are different kinds of capitals, right? Social capital is, is more of like a, what I would term as the wellness of a community. How, how much people are willing to do for each other in such a, for example, social network and so on. Okay? So here's some more takeaway points. Social capital refers to the connections among individuals. So we're talking about things like norms of reciprocity, uh, trustworthiness that comes from social networks, and how to keep that going. It's very easy to let a community die, okay? So it's how, how we keep that kind of thing going. And so there are three dimensions of it. Often you'll see two, but there's actually sort of three, okay? Bonding, bridging, and linking. And I'm gonna explain that. Bonding is where you're in a homogeneous network. Okay. Homogeneous means you're with like-minded people within the same group, and you guys helping each other out. So that's that's bonding. Bridging is for a heterogeneous groups. Okay, that is groups of different likeness. Okay, and basically uh, bridging would be if one group would assist another group or help another group, and so on and so forth. That means two 
two or more groups distinctly different helping each other. So that's like bridging. You can imagine a bridge connecting two people, uh, two groups together. Now linking is a newer for not newer one, newer dimension, and it's the idea of tapping on resources that are beyond all the groups. For example, uh, let's say let's say let's say Mandaki for example. Mandaki, you know, is a community that, that helps. It's an organization that helps uh, Malays, correct? And so, what linking for Mandaki, for example, would be to uh, get help from the government. Okay, a completely different group altogether. Okay, that is somebody of resource, whether it's reputation, money, power, whatsoever. So that's linking. So there's these three dimensions. And you might go, okay, so what can I do with all this? Well, someone like me, I've used it for research. So I've the idea of social capital sort of give us a way to to sort of measure the health of a community. Okay, so I call it's, it's likened to a conceptual tool for examining various communities. I'm just going to show you an example of how I did it. So in this case here, I looked at a bunch of websites run by uniform groups, okay, like girl guys, voice brigades, and so on. Political groups, you know, workers party, PAP, and so on. Ethnic groups, so Mandaki, and uh, what else? We have uh, we have a bunch, and then uh, non-profit and government organizations. So. I classify them like that, okay? So G for government and so on and so forth. And basically, I go through their website and I interview them over the phone, okay? Um, and then I, I sort of like cross out whatever features they have that might fit into the various genres, okay? Whether it's to establish connections, reinforce connections, and so on. And then sort of like judge the health um, of a community based on this. Now, this alone won't help. This is just the online part. So we, I called them and find out what they do behind the scenes as well or what, what activities they have. So some groups, they, a lot of them of course they say that the website doesn't do everything for them. They, they also have to organize activities, they have to meet people face to face, that's very important. So I, I also count that in you know, face to face event and so on and so forth. So at the end of the day, I found two very, 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 um, uh, very holistically well uh, groups, okay, which, which I have in my um, papers and, and other presentation, but I'll just mention to you, the Girl Guides movement is excellent and Mandaki as well. Girl Guides because they have very interesting features such as um, a pen pal service where they match you to a pen pal overseas. So it strengthens relationships, sort of like a, a bonding with people overseas, other uh, Girl Guides in other countries. So it's, it's a very interesting thing. So they have that going, people are very happy. They, they also have a forum where they don't just involve um, the instructors of Girl Guides, but the, the Girl Guides themselves, as well as their parents. So the parents, let's say if the parent owns a printing company, they can sort of like print pamphlets that are cheaper. So that's also sort of like bridging. Okay, it's bringing the parents as well. So a lot of synergy going, a lot of very, you, you can see where I'm heading with this. It's really tapping on the power of people across different networks. Okay, and then Mandaki is great because uh, unlike the other sites, the other services, they are very, very pro-volunteer, and what they do is they have volunteering uh, opportunities where it's not set in stone. What happens is that they, they say that they have this, and when you call in, they will match a time for you. They'll pick a best time. For, I mean, you get to pick a time that you're comfortable with volunteering, and then you get to pick how long. So a lot of people that I talk to, they say the problem with volunteers is that a lot of them call in, they're interested, but then after all, they drop out. So what's interesting about Bundaki is that they customize it for you. So that's interesting. There's a lot of things that they do. So anyway, that's, that's how I sort of try to assess the social capital of Singaporean uh, websites, okay? Community websites. So that's that. So that's social capital, okay? The usefulness of it and so on. Now then there's this other notion that's in your readings as well, known as the third place. And there's this book called The Great Good Place. And basically, you can buy this off Amazon. This guy called Ray Odenberg, 1991, he wrote about the essential places, okay, that is the concept of home, workplace, and a third place. Now, it might sound bizarre to you, but if you think about it, it kind of makes sense. So, in our lives, our daily <coughs> lives, okay, if you figure out the kinds of places you go, that would be home, of course, you, you start from there, you end there, usually, and then there will be the workplace, which could be the office or the school, that's where you spend the second most amount of time at, okay? And then there'll be a third place. And what could this third place be? Well, the third place could be, um, 
could be a cafe, okay, could be a community center, could be uh, a church, okay, could even be the internet, okay, it doesn't matter, it's a place that you can establish community and have civic life sort of like built in, okay, because you might not be able to practice some of these uh, sort of like uh, linger with your community and so on in places like home and workplace. So you need to find that third place that lets you socialize, all right? And so an example of the third place is Starbucks. Now, the problem with Starbucks is they used it in a marketing campaign. So it's kind of convoluted. They commercialized the idea of third place. But basically, um, one of their marketers read about the third place and used it very much so in their marketing. So that's why you see that they are, when they, they first opened up, unlike other cafes, when they first opened up, they had very comfortable chairs and tables for people to mix and talk and linger and so on. They had free electrical outlets and wireless internet access, most of them. And the largest stores in the States actually, they actually host many concerts for local musicians. So it's kind of like Borders and all that where they have, you know, uh, book sessions or music sessions and so on. So they try and create an environment where the community gets together, okay? But this is how one company sort of like used it commercially. There are other examples as well. And like I mentioned, third places can be um, other establishments like churches, uh, places of religion, places of communities, and so on. Uh, it can also exist as virtual environments. You know, uh, So the internet, we'd be talking about forums, we'd be talking about MMORPGs like, like uh, Second Life and so on and so forth. So third place, okay, that's, that's a concept where it, where it's also useful in understanding how, why, where com communities actually exist. Okay, so this is more of a where it's where it's at. Okay, third place. And so we have this thing. Uh, it's a very common I mindset that a lot of uh, people have. Even some of us, some of you students also might have this idea. What makes the internet so different from previous communication media? Okay, a lot of you, for example, say that oh, internet invasion privacy forums, uh, blogs, I don't want to put everything in there. Um, but the question here is, what's so different about it? Okay, the question here is, what's so different about it? Um, there's this term called presentism. Okay, if you look it up, you'll find it. Presentism, it's also mentioned in your readings. It is the belief that present circumstances are not connected to historical circumstances. That means uh, the, way we, the way we behave or think is very much centered in the way life is right now. We tend to forget how life was so different back, back then and that um, the way we thought would have been very different as well. So I'm going to explain a little bit about that. So it's related to that problem of history and moral judgment. So for example, in writing history about slavery, okay, the practice was where in an era where the practice was widely accepted, some believe that the language that condemns slavery is wrong or evil would be presentist and should be avoided. Okay? So, okay, so back then slavery was okay. Right now slavery is bad. So if we write our papers, we might say that, oh, this is this is this was bad. It was silly, it was stupid, or whatever. This is bad. But that's very presentist because that was the environment that the environment back then. Uh, if you think about it today, it's kind of ironic, but we, we Singaporeans are very well known for having maids. So it's kind of slavery as well, but it's just that we we see that oh everybody has it, it's fine. Okay, so that that idea should be sort of like carried on into the technology mindset as well, sort of like break that mindset. That so what about the privacy and all that? When we had similar kinds of issues in the past as well. So questions that arise would be things like are virtual communities necessary? Lead worse than physical communities? So physical communities might have their pros and cons as well. It's just that we don't. We, we tend to focus on the flaws of, of what we see today. Is there such a thing as a physical community? Because you might have a place, but the place doesn't, doesn't, um, isn't the soul of a community. It's still the people. Okay? So is there such a thing as a physical community? I, I doubt so. So whether it's virtual, physical, whatsoever, a community is still a community. Okay? And what would be the equivalent of an online community back in the 1870s? You know, if you think about that, what would be the equivalent? You might not have digital communication back then, but people, if you read the readings, there are several examples which you should go read. Um, in Sense and Sensibility, for example, the movie and the book, um, 
you see that uh, the characters travel great distances to meet people of like-mindedness, of similar interests and so on. And so it isn't exactly virtual, but it covered great distance. Okay? And today, right from our computer, we can cover that same great distance in shorter span of time. So there are different iterations of this happening. What we, what we call online communities today might have been long distance communities back in the day as well, back in the old days. Okay? They might have had telephones, but same problems then. Okay? So they might be able to cover a great distance, but they don't really know who the person is. So just to sum up that idea, there's the idea of community, communities as utopian dreams, that is, uh, of greatness, of perfection. Okay? For example, in this quote, I found it full of 24-hour compassionate ears and souls. They not only listened, they talked back. They helped. I found myself keeping a kind of online journal in the company of these people I'd never laid eyes on. It seemed kind of miraculous, really. This communion, communion late at night in front of the screen. So for example, last night, um, who was that? How, who was that? Who was that? Yeah, Rezo Dazzle was asking about is she here today? Just the, no. No. Yeah, she on Twitter she asked about, oh my pastor is dying, <laughs> I need to find a vet. I said I couldn't, I, I don't know any vets, my hamsters just die and I burn them or bury them. And then Renhao came in with one where, you know, uh, there's a vet in Clementi and so on and so forth. So the idea of perfection is there, it, that yeah, idea. Yeah. But of course then there's the very common Singaporean and actually a lot of people who, what I call laggards who, who, who might not have gotten it yet or think they know it all. That's very interesting when you think you know it all. Uh, the dystopian nightmares. Okay? Rather than providing a replacement for crumbling public realm, virtual communities are really <coughs> contributing to its decline. They are, another thing, keeping people indoors off the streets. Just as TV produces couch potatoes, so online culture creates mouse potatoes. People who hide from real life and spend their whole life goofing off inside the space. Okay, so two contrasting views here. Very real. Okay. This graphic, this, this picture, was in your readings as well. It illustrates the kind of connections that we have today that we cannot uh, deny. Okay. On the left is non-kin, on the right is kin, that is family and so on. So you have friends on this side and so on. You're in the middle. This is the distance of how well you know the person and so on. So this is sort of like a picture of someone's um, relationship with others. It's what we call a personal, personal social network. Okay? So these nodes are different kinds of people involved. And so we are made up of things like these. Okay? We are not just made up of people in the center, but we are made up of everything. We can't, we can't deny that we are made up of everything, of people around us, okay? So, in the readings as well, we mentioned of strong ties and weak ties. Understand how, what these ties are about. Strong ties binds us to people who are like us. Weak ties provide links to other social networks. And the major debate, which a lot of you actually alluded to in your, your blogs, is whether uh, it's possible to develop strong ties online. What do you think? Is it possible to build strong ties online or is it forever cast to being weak links? Any ideas? Any of you have personal experiences where you actually build a strong tie of somebody that you don't really know or you might have met online? Plenty of you, right? To the point I end up meeting the people. Ah, okay. So Han actually met someone. Any of you met people they make online? Annual visits. Annual visits, yeah. you mean people overseas? Yeah. Wow. What kind of people are these? Basically fellow Middle East, though, but, but, but yeah, the support okay. is there. Yes. What, what about the rest of you? Met anybody online or anything like that? But that might be a bit strong, but you don't have to meet them face to face. There are people out there who might be your online buddies who help you out in times of needs and so on. Okay. So you guys don't have any, or do you guys? Actually, the rest of you don't have any online people who really like you really can talk to. Used to. I mean, we're missing the days of those pen pal days, you know. Like back in the day before the internet, and all that pen pals are so big. Actually, and online ties, online ties. If you know how to maintain it, and, and and it can really make you go very far. 
in a very short, in the shortest possible time. Yeah, you, you can. And I guess over a longer period of time, you can reinforce that. In fact, one of you actually wrote in your blog post, I think it was Jonathan again. No, I don't know. Some, or is it the other Jonathan? Yep. He wrote about how Twitter might not be good at allowing you to make friends because you kind of have to know who your friends are right, to, to make friends with them. But it's great. But it's great for building on those relationships. So it's not good at making friends, but it's good on reinforcing those relationships. So different technology, different whether it's pen and paper to Twitter or whatever, they serve different needs and purposes. Okay? Alright. So just as um, you've, we've talked about signals before, there's also cost of entries to communities. Um, for new communities, there might be strict, uh, weak and strong ties, but for new tribalistic communities, it's all strong ties. Any of you know what new tribalistic is? No idea. Okay. What's Neo? Yeah. Not the guy from Matrix. What's Neo? Neo is kind of like Neo, right? Neo. Neo. Okay, fine. <laughs> so, um, if you if you look up Neo tribalism online, you'll find classified with a lot of other ideas of what um, future societies are going to be like or thought to be like. Okay. So right now, the way we live our lives, the modern society, okay, we have companies, businesses, we have very separate, long distance kinds of relationships. What neo tribalism is about is a belief that mankind used to start from tribal communities, or tribal yeah, communities, but has been distracted and led into this modern society. And we are very unhappy about it. We see lots of problems with it. With it. We know about social, social turmoil, uh, stratification, class stratification, economic troubles, welfare problems, and so on and so forth. So everybody's more desolate in a sense. Okay, this is the picture of it. Okay. Neo tribalism is the idea that we have this need or instinct to go back into our tribal roots and to forget all these, all these modern uh, amenities and so on and so forth. Okay, so it's a philosophy. Okay, where we want to forge back the strong ties that we've lost. Okay, maybe in the future once we use technology enough. We might come to the realization that all this is just a waste of time, and let's go back to the way we were. Okay, so that's the idea of it. Okay. So lots of mention about virtual versus real life. Is real life a good distinction? Okay. What is real life? It involves virtual as well. So the effects of online interaction on, on online online interaction on offline communities. We know that happens because whether we talk about online can be carried on to offline environments as well. So the suggestion here is that today's community is mediated to a greater or lesser extent by technology. Like it or not, it does affect the way we, we lead our lives. Okay? We can't just avoid it. All right? Okay, so basically there's a lot more, but basically um, these are from your readings, the idea of the seven key questions. These are things that um, are in the reading because they tackle things that people talk about that are very popular, that people sort of ponder when they think about where we are right now in terms of the way we lead our lives, whether it's virtual or not. So questions include things like, are relationships narrow and specialized or are they broadly based? So the idea of, you know, are they strong or are we, are we, are we having weak links everywhere? And we kind of have a gist of that. What kind of support can one expect to find in virtual communities? So, we, we've experienced that some way or another. Some of you should be able to answer that question uh, to some extent. How does the net affect people who sustain weaker and less intimate relationships and to develop new ones? So, you know, you can give real hard examples of that. Okay, and so on and so forth. Reciprocation, attachment. We've talked about this, gift economies. Okay. So, understand that these questions are very real questions and they, uh, when these writers, Wellman, wrote, wrote about it back then. These were things that uh, were very important, and it's still important today. Okay. So, same thing. Question four is a very big one. Uh, to what extent are strong, intimate relationships possible on the net? So, there are people who met others online and get married, but those are very. I think they're still sort of idiosyncratic, and they don't have to be that extreme. I think the good ones are the ones where um, they sort of like are your buddies online. Back in the days of IRC. Uh, I remember a story where uh, 
somebody, you know, there'll be a bunch of people who'll be chatting all the time, and one day, um, this person who was chatting suddenly sort of like stopped chatting, and <clears throat> uh, the, the people who were in there sort of realized that, hey, why is this person dropped off? Usually they put BRB if they're gone, right? Or something like that. But why is this person gone? So one of them got worried and actually called the person up and found that there was no response, and then quickly called the ambulance, and true enough, that person was actually a senior citizen and he collapsed already. So it's interesting, you know, there's this watchdog thing where people watch for each other and that's also a very strong idea of how <coughs> strong relationships can happen, okay? So there are many, many examples and you should be aware of some of these examples. So when somebody comes up to you and says, ah, oh, this virtual community is, what's the point? I mean, there are real relationships in there and you just have to find them, okay? It's easier to find the flaws, it's hard to find the good stuff. Okay, so and so on and so forth. So there are plenty of examples here. But what I want to go right into right now is the non-traditional online communities. Okay? Twitter is one of them. Uh, let's see, it's 9.48. Do you guys want to take a break? Yeah. Okay, take a break first and then I'll show you some examples. How do you use the